So mm, there's some words when you kind of put them together in the same sentence, you you, you kind of wonder what, what's going on here. I mean, for instance, fish and bicycle or multiplayer and enterprise, for instance. So let's actually first start by having a look at what, what I mean with those words. So when we talk about enterprise software, what that means is software that it's something that you not build it really for the user, but rather for the organization that that user works for. So uh, this is a quite invisible part of software development in one way, because uh, when you go to conferences and so on, it's very much about the, the public facing stuff. But in reality, a big majority of all software development happening in the world today it is this kind of enterprise building internal business applications, basically. One interesting thing with uh, this uh, enterprise software development is that usually they are, so to say, a little bit behind compared to, again, uh, consumer-faced uh, software. So uh, things like NoSQL databases, Kubernetes, event sourcing, microservices, all those kinds of things, they first started in in the space of, of consumer facing applications and then gradually also got into enterprise software development. Then when we come to multiplayer, uh, I think we got three waves of different kind of multiplayer kind of software. Uh, and with multiplayer here, I mean anything where you have multiple users interacting with each other or with a network through that software. So many, many years ago, we got the first wave with uh, the first multiplayer games and also the first uh, chat and instant messaging solutions. Mm. Then a while back, we got in a way a second wave of multiplayer software. Uh, and these were, mm, well, for instance, Google Docs is one, one typical example. Another is uh, Figma, which is a collaborative drawing tool. So yes, these are used by enterprises, but they are still not really enterprise software. Mm. So what we got now coming up is a third wave where it's actually you building multiplier software for enterprise use. So uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. We got a pandemic that really made people not spend time together in the office, but instead interacting through software. But also we got uh, more and more technology catching up. For instance, uh, 10, 15 years ago, web sockets were not an easy to use option, but nowadays it's quite easy. Mm. And that leads us to the first question we got for you people. Yeah, so if you hop down to the lower right and, and check out the polls tab, uh, we have a poll for you. Uh, do you have use cases for collaboration between users in your custom software apps? So select one of these. Yes, a lot. Yes, some. Yes, a few. No, not sure. Or what do you mean by collaboration use case? And we're getting results here. Uh, most seem to have, I think, kind of, Maybe one indication that you might have is if you are aware that your users are using kind of out of band communication to coordinate, for instance, like post-it notes or shouting <laughs> to coordinate. That's one thing. Uh, or maybe if you have optimistic locking in your application, that might be a, a sign already. Yeah, but also I would say we got a little bit of bias here because people interested in this topic probably do have more than people <laughs> yes. in general. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. So yes, we can see here that we're, we're slowly getting in more and more results, but yes, a few is definitely win winning. Then not sure uh, is in second place. And I think that's interesting because that's kind of what we have been thinking as well, that once you start seeing the cases, you start recognizing where it's useful. But hopefully uh, as we go on here, with Lay's presentation, uh, you maybe get a little bit of a more insight into if you might have this problem or not. So right now we have yes, a few on top and not sure, 
second place. Yes, a lot is in third place. Yes, some in fourth place. And then we have no with just a few uh, answers. So, so yeah, it definitely looks like this is a, a, a good topic. So with that, Leif, back to you and your presentation. Thank you. What we're going to go through now uh, is uh, basically a case study, because like mentioned, we have this collaboration kit product that we have been building. And through that, we have learned a whole bunch of what are all the things you need to take into account, what's a suitable architecture and so on. So the main point here really is to just share our experiences about how, how to build these great multiplayer experiences and if you also think that, hey, using Vardin's collaboration kit would be a good way, then of course you should do that. But still, that's not the main point with what we're talking about here. So really kind of three different sections of the presentation. First, looking at use cases, what things look like from the user's point of view. Then looking at architecture, how should you structure your data? How could you structure your code in a way that makes it easy to build these kinds of things? And then finally, because someone will always ask, but does it scale? So finally, I'll, a couple of words about how to also make these kinds of things work in a clustered environment. But let's start from the beginning, use cases. We all know the use case format. As a multiplayer enterprise application, I want to be multiplayer so that enterprise, well, uh, well, Actually, what it really is about is it's about working together in multiplayer applications. In, for instance, many multiplayer games, you compete against this other, each other. But here in applications that you use for work, it's really about doing things together. So it's either between your colleagues or then it's between business partners, so suppliers and, and customers agreeing on something, working together to, to reach something. The other thing to mention is that this is just for, typically it's a small group, kind of a teamwork. Uh, we're not talking here about mass events with kind of 100,000 persons watching a, a, a Mars rocket explode or, or things like that. Mm. And what, what these enterprise applications typically are is basically they are CRUDs. You, load stuff from the database, you view it, you create new things, but that's more or less all there is to it if you look at it from a, from a kind of bird's eye view. Mm. And, and for this example, uh, we got two different users. We got March and we got Homer. They all have their own web browser where they see different things from the application. Mm. And a really typical example is uh, in this example application, it's kind of for keeping track of all the different developer resources, kind of live events and so on that, that, that you might be interested in attending. Uh, and, and what we have here is kind of Marge and Homer, each on their own computer, looking at the same, same entry in this database and seeing that, hmm, maybe I should make some changes here. Uh, so they each click the edit button, they get an edit form. Each of them make different edits to the contents of this form. Uh, and then Marge is the first one to save. And well, she sees the updated version. Then independent of Marge, Homer is also saving. And now we don't really know what happened because there's a conflict between the changes that these did. Uh, and how can we deal with that? That's, in a way, it's a multiplayer. Uh, question. One thing you can do that is really easy is to just, if you're using, for instance, Hibernate or something, just enable optimistic locking. So that means that when they try to save, uh, what happens is, well, there's an exception and it's up to you to handle that. So with just this small change in the application, in that case, Homer would have noticed that now there was a problem, there was a conflict, but he still couldn't do anything about it. So one step further is that uh, in the application, you can catch this exception when the database says that, no, there's been a concurrent modification. And then you show to that user who, who came in second, 
show a, a new dialogue where they can kind of see that, oh, this was the original value, this was the thing that someone else put there, and then it's up to that user to, to manually merge that conflict, basically. So that's one, one option. Another option is to completely avoid the problem by locking out others from editing while one person is editing this particular entity. So in this example, uh, we again got uh, margin Homer. And now when Homer starts editing, you notice that the edit button becomes disabled for Marge. And she can, for instance, also see that who is now editing. Mm. So what this means now is, is, yeah, Homer can go on making his edit. And also thanks to having this and now kind of multiplayer ena enabled with live updates and so on, immediately when Homer pre presses save, then anyone else who looks at the read-only view, their view will also be updated so that they see the new update and they also get their edit button enabled again. So this again, it helps. It helps avoid the conflict, but at the same time, it's not really perfect because for instance, what happens if, if Homer is really slow and, and Marge has something that she really needs to get done immediately. And, and there's a whole bunch of those problems. So uh, one alternative we can kind of supplement this with is that yes, we're still locking it, but we also have an embedded chat. So uh, Marge doesn't only see that, well, now Homer is editing and we can't edit, but also there's a chat box there she can write a message, Homer will see that. So she can say that, hey, can you also do this and that quickly while you're doing your things? And well, Homer can also respond back and so on. And we still also have this kind of live thing that immediately when they're done, then the others also see that and can start editing instead, uh, continue editing. Mm. But there's still some problems because, again, if this takes a long time and Marge has some more complicated things she wants to do, maybe she just can't kind of write a message in a Slack chat box, but actually needs to have, uh, have more, more complicated things done. So what if there would also be, for instance, a checkbox saying that kind of put me in, in a queue here and notify me, me when it's my turn to edit. So then she can, well, she clicks that button or checks the box, and then she can go on to some other part of the application and look at other interesting developer events. Uh, and, and then once Homer is done, then March will get a notification saying that, hey, now this thing that you were waiting for, now it's available, click here to, to, to proceed there. So now we have solved quite many problems, but there's still some problems. So for instance, what if Homer goes on a lunch break while he's still editing? He keeps his form open. And well, Homer being Homer, he's run over by a bus on his way back. So what this really, really means is that you also, with this kind of structure, need some way of breaking the lock, releasing it without, without having to wait for Homer to get back from his sick leave and so on before anyone else can edit this, this item. So we can actually do even better because we can make the editing itself collaborative without having those conflicts. And the trick for that is that you edit a draft copy together. So the way this would work is, again, Homer has started editing and Marge now also has the edit button uh, clickable. So when she clicks on it, uh, they both see uh, in their own screen Avatar showing that, okay, who else is also editing this at the same time? And if, for instance, if Homer focuses the, the, the text field, then Marge immediately sees on her view what's going on. So now she knows that probably she, she, she should avoid that text field, but all the others are kind of up for grabs. So she can edit some other part of the form at the same time. Mm. What you notice here is, uh, well, actually, no, one more step. Also, of course, when Homer is done editing, immediately when he moves the cursor out of that field, then everyone else also sees this shared copy that they are editing together. So in many ways, this is similar to, for instance, what you have in Google Docs or in Figma and so on. 
with the big difference being that here we are editing business data. We're editing structured data. We got this set of fields that we're editing. It's not just one big document, but instead structured based on business requirements. One thing that this also lead to is that what if someone else is, just when you're about to hit the save button, someone else makes an incomplete change to some, to some field. So to deal with that, instead of having a save button, what we really need to have in the UI is a preview button. So when you click that preview button, you, you don't immediately save, but instead you get an overview of what you're about to save. Because again, also in business applications, there's quite often that whenever you save something, those changes kind of, they happen in your name. You are the one who is responsible for doing those changes, especially then kind of with say banking service systems where actually money is transferred immediately when you save something. So for those reasons, it's very important to be able to preview and then you save exactly what's on the screen in this preview uh, dialogue. And if you realize that, oh, now there's something that you didn't expect, then you can con continue back to editing. But if you're happy, then you can save. To summarize these UI concepts, we have identified uh, five different things that you can combine in a whole bunch of different ways. For instance, you could have also a chat box in that uh, previous use case when you edit, edit a draft, copy together, and so on. But again, five different concepts. We got presence to see who's there. We got locking to disable some things while one person is working. We got notifications to see, to get get a notice when, when something interesting has happened. We got uh, messaging to be able to communicate, chat, or, or so on. And then finally, we got the concept of editing things together. Mm. This leads us to the next question we got for you. So over to you, Mark. Yes, polling time. So hop over to the panel. You know what to do. Um, so let's see this time, the question is, what use cases for collaboration are relevant in your apps? So, and you can select multiple here. So yep. and here the ones that, that those use cases yeah. again for a reminder. Exactly. So presence, locking, notifications, chat or messaging, editing together. Then you have other none and don't know also as options. And if you if you have something other in mind already, feel free to kind of hop in the questions <laughs> questions tab and add there if you if you feel like it. That would be interesting to see. Uh, yes, I think for us we have at least realized that it usually kind of starts out with some use case that the application desperately needs, you kind of realize. But then once you get into the kind of mindset, then you realize all these other cases, which would actually benefit quite quite a lot from, from having some of these features. So right now, uh, the poll is saying that locking is the top one, notifications second, and presence third editing together and chat messaging. And then we have a few others and, and none and don't know as well. So is that Leif about what we maybe would be expecting? Actually, not truly. Really. This is interesting because we did a whole bunch of customer interviews when we started to build collaboration kit and based on those, if I remember right, it was editing together that came out as the as the winner. Whereas, for instance, actually, I don't think we even asked about locking in that case. But uh, mm. for instance, notifications was really in the bottom of, of our list based on those interviews. So I don't know, is this just different audience or has the times changed because this was a couple of years ago, but still interesting to see. Yeah, that would be interesting to kind of hear more about. I have one theory is that I think locking is kind of easy to uh, implement in an existing solution. So that might be kind of part of that. But let's continue with the presentation. Go ahead, Leif. Yep. Mm. So those were the use cases. Mm. Like we saw, 
you get lots of new possibilities when you add multiplayer concepts to the application. But at the same time, like we saw, there's some gotchas to, to watch out for. So you might need to give the UI design uh, a second thought also. And in some cases, even also thinking about your business processes, because, uh, well, one extreme example I heard about was one, uh, one company where the people were kind of, they got bonus based on how many forms they could fill in, which meant that they kind of, they had an incentive to prevent others from doing stuff. So they, with the first version that they built, people were just kind of locking other people out just so that they would have a chance of, of making those edits instead. And that was obviously not so good in the long run. Anyways, let's go on to the architecture. So, I mean, I assume most of you are developers, not UI designers. So you probably want to also know, what should I think about to make this work? The first thing really is to realize that what we're dealing with here, it's UI state. It's very much isolated to the UI layer. We got these different persons, they see the same data and so on, but it probably isn't really related to the back end of the application. Also, this UI state is, well, it's state, it's stateful, which means that at the very least, each user has their own WebSocket open, which again means that a pure kind of uh, function as a service architecture might be problematic and so on. Also, again, a reminder, we're talking about enterprise applications. We got people in small teams collaborating. So it, we don't need to even optimize this for the case with thousands and thousands of users. Instead, in most cases, it's kind of one or two, or well, one person collaborating is a little bit boring, but two or three or maybe four persons looking at the same time, same thing at the same time, but never kind of thousands or, or millions. Finally, with this UI state that we have, uh, it's useful to still structure it to avoid contention, avoid situations where many, many persons want to update the same data at the same time, because essentially that's, that's what makes things slow. That's what makes things complicated. A little bit more about that structure. A good example of this would be in a chat application. What we have here is a couple of different channels. And when you, the channel you have clicked on, for that one, you see the messages. But at the same time, we also got the sidebar with the channels. And for that, we also have updates because whenever there's an unread message in one of those channels, then you want to get that one highlighted. So bold in this case. What this means is that you might want to split up your kind of UI state. So you got one, one chunk where you got kind of for each channel, you got one bunch that just contains the messages. And then only those who look at that channel at that time are kind of actively interacting with that data. But then for the sidebar, you got, for instance, only a list of for each channel, what's the last updated timestamp for that. And then whenever that updates, each user's UI logic can, can see what, what to update in the sidebar. One thing this means is that you don't have the data normalized like you would in a SQL database. And for some of us old timers, that's, it's just wrong. But again, reminding this is, it's not the authoritative data of the, of the kind of business process here. It's only the UI state that we're sharing. So it's, it's very fine to have duplicates or aggregations and so on and store those separately. Uh, another thing here is uh, just terminology. So uh, we have chosen to treat each of these kind of isolated things that correspond to one part of the UI and that some, some bunch of people are subscribed to. We choose to, to name these topics. So this is kind of similar to what you have, for instance, with JMS topics for messaging or Kafka topics for event sourcing. This is a little bit of a different concept, but still quite the same. Next thing that you get into when you try to design this kind of system is what kind of consistency model to use. 
there are two different schools of thought here. We got either eventual consistency or then we got strong consistency. Uh, some examples here, eventual consistency, that's when you got a decentralized system. Uh, things can happen anywhere at any time. You got kind of peer to peer style of, of how changes are de dealt with and so on. Whereas with strong consistency, things are centralized. You got one authoritative source that decides that now, now this is what the official data looks like. And Update, all updates need to go through that uh, central point. Mm. Technology-wise, for eventual consistency, there's a CRDT or conflict-free replicated data type is the most popular technology kind of umbrella term for, for those things. Uh, there's also operational transformation, which is a little bit older, but, but still also used. Uh, for strong consistency, uh, one very popular example nowadays is event sourcing, where kind of the log of events goes through centralized event database or Kafka or whatever, and then that one is, is the authoritative source. Uh, one example of what these CRDTs might mean, uh, one of the most simple CRDT types is a grow-only counter. What that means is that every user keeps track of what's the latest value that they have seen from all of the other users. So let's say for instance, that Marge knows that her own counter value is three. And last time she was, her data was synced with Homer, his value was four. Homer then again, last time he spoke with Marge, she had one and, and he had five, oh, and now he has five. So depending on who you ask, the total counter value is either seven or six. But also, if we get these two updates, we can take the maximum value of each of those. So it's three plus five. So eight is the kind of the total number of time that any of these two users have incremented. The trick really with these uh, conflict three types is to basically put constraints on how you can update your data so that it's impossible to get conflicts. The thing though, is that this also means that's impossible to be certain about anything because uh, you, there can always the, be this one more message that arrives late, which invalidates as assumptions that you have all, already made. On the other hand, uh, so actually one example of this is that you, you cannot do locking or you would have to do locking in a really weird way, kind of, I assume I was the first one to get the lock and now I make these changes based on that assumption. And if it turns out that someone else actually kind of had the lock instead of me, then all my changes would have to be reverted also because otherwise there might be a conflict. On the other hand, the kind of drawback with strong consistency is that you need to wait for acknowledgement because before you can be certain about anything. And that in turn means to kind of delays and, and problems if the server goes down and so on. Anyways, what we have concluded is that for this kind of UI state, strong consistency is still preferable in part because kind of you can actually be certain and also because uh, with this being only UI state, we don't have the same scalability problems that lead to eventual consistency being popular in, in NoSQL databases and so on. The other thing to look at is how do you structure your data? Uh, what we have concluded is that uh, JSON, so just kind of lists and uh, maps, that's really all we need. And that also helps keep the data model simple, which means that updating is, is also easier. So for instance, a lock, that's just a list of, the first one in the list is the one who has the lock right now. And the others in the list, they are basically the queue waiting for to, to acquire the lock. Presence. That's again, it's JSON array, but now it's interpreted as a, a set of all the people who are present in, in this specific uh, topic. Notifications, that's a list of objects where each object describes one notification. Messages for a chat, that's again, just a list of objects with each object representing a chat message. Editing, you got a slightly simplified case, but it's again, it's an object where each 
field that you can edit has its own value. And if you want to track focus and so on, then it's just a more complex object that contains the value and who has it focused right now. Mm. What this also means is that each of these things, they are kind of, whenever anything changes in this data, that also corresponds to a change in the UI for all the users. So when something changes in the list, lost uh, in the lock list, uh, some user gets a notification that, hey, or confirmation that, hey, now it's locked. Now I can do things where someone else see that, okay, now it's this person editing. One thing to also point out here is that you can have multiple of these in the same topic. So when you, for instance, again, in the form example, you got the editing stuff and the presence who are editing this form, they two relate to each other. So they belong in the same topic. Then how is this data updated? And here we got to, again, one of the popular topics right now, which is event sourcing. So basically every change to this data, it's yet, yet another JSON object, for instance, that describes an atomic modification. And these things kind of happen one after the other. So first we got, for instance, a message saying that for the lock in this topic, let's insert Homer as the last one. And it was empty before. So now the lock list contains only one person. Basically Homer has acquired this lock now. Then when March comes along, also want to get the lock. Then there's another insert last message that says that, well, let's also add March to this list. And now she's in the queue. And then when Homer is done editing, uh, we get a kind of remove first operation for the lock item. And then that removes Homer. And that means that uh, March is, is now the first one. One thing to notice here is that these operations need to be expressed in a way that again can avoid conflicts. Because if, if we would just say uh, insert March at index two, then what happens if moments before someone else also inserted something at index two or removed something so that index two doesn't exist anymore and so on. So because of that, these are, are expressed in a way that ordering doesn't cause conflicts, but of course it might still cause surprises. Also, what we see here is, like I spoke about previously, that each of these messages in the lock, each of them correspond to one update in the UI also. If we were building this just for a simple, simple application, we would just need this as in-memory event log, and we would basically be done. It gets a little bit more complicated with clustering, but we'll look at that in a while. First, there's one more gotcha that, that might cause some surprises. And that's how do you structure the code for subscribing to these topics? So basically whenever a user opens a form or something, what happens for them to get, get in sync with what others have done there? So if we just we pretend we have an object uh, representing the topic and then subscribe with it with a callback to make those corresponding UI updates. The problem here is that you need to take the initial state into account also, not just the updates that happen after you have subscribed. One way you could deal with that is to have something like this. So first you initialize the UI based on the current state in the topic. And then after that, you start subscribing to updates. Obviously this leads to, to two problems actually. The first one is that now you have duplicated logic because in this case, both your initialize UI function and the update UI function, they both do roughly the same thing, but you still need to implement them slightly differently. A bigger problem though is you might miss events in case something happens between when you run initialize UI and when you subscribe. You could solve this just by switching the order, first you subscribe and then you initialize but then you instead get problems with uh, potentially getting duplicate events and so on. The solution for this is to move the problem to a library. So basically, what if the topic would instead provide a way of initializing with synthetic events based on 
the initial state and then at the same time start updating incrementally as things happen live. So in this way, yes, this init and subscribe implementation is a little bit complicated, but every time you use this in different parts of the UI logic, you don't need to care. You just give that one callback that builds up the UI based on what the state is and updates to that state. Now, on to Mark again for some more questions. Yes, and we're on to our last poll. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for your organization in implementing collaboration features? And you can select multiple here. So the options are not sure how collaboration might apply, apply to our app, not sure what the value is for collaboration features. Collaboration features aren't a high priority for users. Collaboration features aren't a high priority for management. Difficulty in designing collaboration features. And difficulty in development of collaboration features. Other and don't know. So let's take a quick look here and Difficulty in development of collaboration features is, is leading. Uh, collaboration features aren't a high priority for management and then difficulty in designing collaboration features. I think this is probably not a surprise and uh, it can even be related because kind of, if it's difficult to develop, then I guess management might not be that excited about getting behind it. Uh, or if you can't kind of design it and uh, don't know exactly how it should work, then it might be hard to make that jump. What do you think, Leif? Definitely. Uh, I may be more interested in the following one. So, so kind of fourth place here that collaboration features aren't a high priority for users, because that's also what I very much believe that in very, very many cases, the users would benefit from this, but yes, indeed, it is It is more complicated. It is more expensive to implement than just the basic basic optimistic lock exception and, and leaving it at that. Yeah, I think we have some of those examples where some feature has been implemented and, and actually shown to the users and they can try it and they are really enthusiastic because it solves a problem that they actually had. But it's kind of, it's, hard to see that this is missing. So that might be a, a big part of this here. Okay, but those are interesting answers. Let's get on with your presentation, Leif. Yeah, I actually saw there was a kind of question that isn't a question, but but someone is was a little bit lost on channels. I guess that refers to uh, what I was showing with this chat example if i can find that slide anymore there it is so uh the concept here is again kind of how you split up the data in a way that all the users that actually collaborate use the same shared data but you don't have it so that every change that anyone does to anything needs to be uh informed to everyone because again if 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 i'm looking at the random channel in this kind of chat ui example and mark is looking at announcements then even if i write hundreds of messages in the random channel then it doesn't matter to to mark what's going on there and again kind of how you structure things how you lay out data in memory if you do that so that those two things the messages in random and the messages in announcements that they are separate from each other, then that helps you uh, simplify things also to avoid concurrent modification problems and, and all those kinds of things. So that's, hopefully it helps. Uh, we can continue also with that, but uh, let's for now continue with, with the presentation a bit. Uh, as promised, we shouldn't spend much time on collaboration kit, but still showing a little bit kind of the concepts here and how we have been able to use these ideas that I presented to simplify things. So um, 
really central concept when you use a uh, Vardin collaboration kit is the user info object. Uh, this represents a user. So for instance, if the same user kind of, the same person is logged in through their phone and on a laptop, for instance, then they would still be identified as the same person. So they wouldn't be shown twice in a group of avatars, for instance. Uh, and this, this is then used throughout, mm, throughout the APIs. And really to, to have this avatar group, all you need to do is to create an avatar group component. So that's a UI component. Give it the current user info, give it the name of a topic. So this can be any string and all the users who use who have the same string in their <laughs> in their component configuration, they will see each other or each other's uh, avatars there. And with Vardin, that's just a UI component that you can add to any layout. And in that way, you have, have a collaborative presence indicator there. Messaging is basically the same concept, even though this is split up into two separate components. So there's a message list that you initialize with who is the user and who is uh, what's the topic ID. So again, in this case, with, with a chat, each topic ID could, for instance, be a name of a chat room. So random and announcements and general or, or whatever you have, have as the names there. Uh, <clears throat> then in many cases, you also want to allow users to enter messages there. But this is still a separate component so that you can put it in, in other places uh, in the UI and so on. And this input component, it, it's then initialized with the message list so that they are hooked up so that whenever you submit something through the message input, it goes to the to the right topic and in the name of the right user and so on. And again, these being layout components, so just, uh, these being UI components, so you can just add them to any body layout to actually show them on the user screen. Finally, we got the form example. Uh, so here again, the same user info, and then in, in Vardin in general, you got a class called binder that is used for form binding. Here, there's also a collaboration binder, which is quite similar. So it it's actually shares most of the APIs. Usually with binder, you initialize it with the class that you want to edit. So person entities in this case, and then also you give the, again, the current user to be able to show, show those pop-ups uh, when someone edits a field and so on. Use the regular, for instance, bind instance fields that you use with the regular binder also. But then finally, to start using this, you need to bind it to a topic. And with the regular binder, you in immediately give the kind of, here's the person object that we're editing. But in this case, since you have multiple persons editing the same thing, only the first one should actually load that person object from the database, whereas for other users, it should just keep using the draft copy that is based on the database value and whatever edits have been done. So for this reason, when you set a topic, you also give a callback that can load the, the initial data if needed. But again, if it's already initialized, if you're the second or the third or the fourth user and so on, then this callback will never be run. And in that way, you avoid loading things from the database uh, many times. This is the summary of the architecture. We got really central thing is this is UI state. We isolate those into topics. It's fine to have denormalization. So it's fine to have uh, duplicate data aggregations and so on between these topics because they are uh, structured by, by the UI components that you see. We got JSON-like structured data here. We update it with an event sourcing architecture. We use strong consistency for the updates to make sure that there are no conflicts. And finally, to make subscription easier, there's synthetic events that kind of emulate events to recreate the initial situation. Then finally, a little bit about clustering. This is something that we still have in development. It's not completed, but it's something that we, we are have looked into and so on for collaboration kit also, but still our findings, they are, they are useful enough. Mm. The thing with clustering is that we assume at least that if you have a cluster for your application, 
or let's take it from the other way. You don't need to add clustering to your application only because you add multiplayer functionality. But if you have clustering for some other reason, probably because you either want high availability or you want to be able to scale up and down flexibly, then you probably also already have some kind of existing infrastructure in that cluster to be able to collaborate between different nodes. Because what we have realized is that building that functionality, that's really complicated. So what you really want to do is you want to avoid building a new distributed system, but instead reuse something existing. So what we really need from that system is, well, first distribute changes between, between these different nodes in a cluster. We want to have strong consistency of the ordering of events within a single topic. It doesn't matter if one topic is updated independently from the other, but within a topic, we want to be certain that this is the order things have happened. And finally, we also want to have uh, exactly once delivery so that uh, there are no, no duplicates and so on. And it turns out that there's lots of systems out there that let you do this. So for instance, event sourcing systems like Kafka or uh, other event databases, uh, In-memory data grids like InfiniSpan or Hazelcast. We got uh, actor-based systems like Akka. We got uh, distributed caches like, uh, well, there's a bunch of those. Uh, you can even use uh, a SQL database combined with JMS. Just JMS on its own is not enough since then you cannot replay the history. But if you store the history in a SQL database, then you can even do that. When you got a cluster, what you have is different computers that are not completely in sync with each other and they can't communicate instantly, but, but instead there's always some latency there. So what that means is that you might kind of have conflict. So for instance, if you've got two different users connected to different uh, servers, both want to acquire the lock, so insert their own name into the, into the end of the queue and hope that they are the first one. So what happens here is that both of these have a message sent to this infrastructure that you have, the Kafka stream or the Hazelcast grid or whatever. And we call that a synchronizer. Because what happens then is that this synchronizer receives all the messages in some order, and then it publishes out events saying that this is the order in which things happened. So for instance, in this case, it might say that, well, I saw the update from Homer first. So that's the one that is the actual official uh, value here. Uh, and in that way, because all users wait for that, they can also, uh, also be certain about what, who actually acquired the lock here. One thing that gets complicated here is with uh, snapshots. Uh, this is quite similar to what you also have with event sourcing, if, if you have looked into those things. Uh, because there will be lots and lots of events in the log and most of them will eventually be redundant because things have been overwritten and so on. Uh, so to, to be able to kind of quickly join a topic, quickly get up to speed with what has happened, in addition to only storing the log of events, you also can store snapshots every now and then. So for instance, in this case, at event index three, so after the third event in the log, we got Marge as the only value in the lock, in the array named lock here. And with that concept, uh, you are then able to, to even at some point discard old events because all you need to be able to join something is to get that latest snapshot. And then you see, okay, this is based on event number three. And then from the event log, you only need to get events starting from number three when you subscribe and in that way, joining that, that system can be much faster than if you need to go through all the events that have been before also. Another thing, again, because we're a cluster, we got latency, which means that depending on the UI case you have, you might need to be wait for confirmation also. So uh, a really simple example here, we got again, uh, Marsh and Homer, they should just pick their favorite letter and like you might guess, Marge picks M and Homer picks H. And this now, in this case, uh, what can happen is 
Mm. When this gets to the synchronizer, then one of them gets first and, oops, this is where I was going, yes. So uh, what might happen here is uh, Marge gets first. And in that case, I mean, now when, when Homer and Marge have clicked their own buttons, what they see in the UI is their own selection. Now when Marge gets to the synchronizer and synchronizer sends out to both Marge and Homer that, hey, now we got this value officially in the event log. Then uh, Marge, for her, it's just a confirmation that, yeah, well, that's what I selected. That's what's there. But for Homer, this is kind of a conflict because Homer knows that he has sent something else there. And he can expect that probably he will get also confirmation on his own message really, really soon. So in this case, in the UI level, he can kind of, or the UI logic running for him, can ignore this change because there's a pending change that conflicts. So then moments later, when the update to age also gets through the synchronizer and distributed to the users, then for Homer, nothing changes. But for Marge, obviously, things flicker a little bit. But still with this kind of optimistic, ignoring some updates until you get confirmation, we avoid the situation where it flicks back and forth for Homer. So this kind of concept, it's not needed, for instance, with uh, with the presence and the notifications use case, because there it doesn't matter who was first. Those who are present, they are present, and that's it. Correspondingly with locking, you always need to wait to get that confirmation from the synchronizer before you actually let the user start editing or whatever. But then with messaging or with uh, editing, uh, it makes sense to have the UI work so that it assumes that things will come in the right place. And this is probably you have even seen in some chat applications that you use. So sometimes you see your own message and then suddenly there pops up kind of a split second later, you also see other, a message that was sent moments before. And then that actually appears above the message that you sent. Those were the things for clustering. So again, assuming you got clustering for other reasons, assuming you got this infrastructure for communicating between the nodes. You can reuse that thing also for collaboration uses. It might be, for instance, Kafka or InfiniSpan or Akka or something like that. It just needs to be some source of truth with strong consistency. And in addition to that, you need snapshots and synthetic events to, again, deal with, with events logs event logs not becoming too long, and then deal with uh, latency compensation to be able to, to, depending on the use case, not keep the user waiting or avoid flickering. Those were all the things on my mind about uh, how to enable multiplayer uh, user experiences. If you want awesome. to know more, then there's a link here. and. In addition to that, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, I think that was really interesting and kind of eye-opening. And kind of for me, at least, uh, there's kind of clear benefits like boosting productivity and avoiding errors and conflicts and just kind of allowing multiple peoples to safely use the same application. But clearly, it's also very difficult kind of concurrency, consistency, conflict resolution. And, you know, it seems to me that everything that starts with a C is, is kind of complicated. Uh, so <laughs> that's what I take away from this. Also, it seems like uh, this is definitely kind of a combination of the technical implementation, but also kind of the UX. Uh, so yeah. how, how does it look for the user and how do you make them aware of what's happening? And I think that we as kind of developers and, and designers and product managers and so on, we're probably not used to taking this into account that much yet. So it's kind of, I think it's super, super good presentation to show kind of both the UX side of it and also the implementation, what you might be looking at that there and kind of start the thought process to kind of see how you can address these issues. 
So I guess with that, if you don't have any last minute questions here, uh, do you have anything else you want to add, Leif? Mm, I'm, I'm good. I already showed all my slides and, and I definitely agree with your commentary there also. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yes, you will be receiving the recording and the slides in your email afterwards. And with that, Thank you for joining us and see you next time. Thank you.